Hello, Steve. I think your presence here is a big surprise for many subscribers because Brasek is super popular in Russia. I conducted a survey on my Instagram and you appear to be the most popular supporting character. Among characters, people have chosen you. <laughs> uh, well, I'm very, very flattered. And I don't know what that says about me or the character Jim and the Russian people, but thank you very, very much. That's quite flattering. And I like to think uh, there's a bit of Jim in everybody. You know, he, he doesn't hold back. He's like one big ball of frustrated anger and he doesn't care who knows it. So thank you very much for the accolade. That's great. Here's my uh, brassic cup. <laughs> Go on, sorry. I think that Jim's so popular in this series because your character is kind of international. In every country, in every city, in every neighborhood, we can find a character like Jim. And I guess you're absolutely right saying that a part of Jim lives in each of us. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Jim's a bit of an everyman. He's that, that frustration in everybody that, that sometimes you want to say something and you can't because of uh, restrictions or whatever. Jim doesn't care about that. When Jim's got something to say, he'll say it. And that's one of the things I like about him. Sometimes he says the most ridiculous, stupid, inane things, but it's Jim. It's almost like he can't help himself to just spout this stuff. How did you get into Brasic? Um, Pretty much the same as, anyway, I went for an audition. I'm a jobbing actor. My agent um, arranged an audition for me for the part of Jim. Obviously, it had never been on before. This was the first series. I read a couple of scenes. I went down to London and I auditioned for the part. I simply read a couple of scenes. Joe was there. Joe was at the audition. So uh, and in the scenes I learned was with Joe, Vincent character. So I just simply went down done a couple of scenes in, in the room with people uh, and then left and that was it. And on my way out, there was a bloke there who really did look like a farmer, a stereotypical farmer. So as soon as I took one look at him, I didn't think I'd get the job. But I was lucky enough to land it and I love playing him. What can you say about Joseph Gilgan? He's fantastic and he's he never stops working. Even when we're on set, his mind is always working. How to make scenes better, how to improve bits of dialogue. And, um, you know, I love that about it. Sometimes a scene as it's written down doesn't end up as it started. It's progressed because he knows the characters so well and he likes it to keep it real. So he's a fantastic bloke. He's a genius. And, and he's a lovely human being, and we all love him. He's our leader. We love him. I love him in real life, and I love his character, Vinny, in it. It's great. How is it working with him? If we're talking about his dyslexia, can we call it a disability or an illness? Well, um, first of all, I don't think he's a disability. I just think he's not like everybody else. <clears throat> but he makes that work for him. Um, like I say, he can improvise on the spot while, while we're filming and make a scene better. He's a pleasure to work with. He's so creative and he's so in that. That really is based on his life story. So he's living the part. It is his life. And we're just round there to help him bring that to viewers. And he must be doing something right because people can't seem to get enough of Brassic. Um, and as, as long as we've got Joe there enthusiastic about it, I think we'll go on for a, a while yet, but hopefully, touch wood. Who is your most favourite character in Brassic? I like Tomo. Reveal the secret. What are we going to see in season four? What can we wait for? I'm no grass. No, I can't share any secrets with you. Just to say that, I think each series is getting better than the previous one. We've nearly finished season four now, 
And I think the scripts are getting better. And the characters are developing more. People, because we've got to know each other over a few years, I think we're all interacting better with each other. We all know the characters so well now that I just think it's improving series by series. And you are in for a treat with some of the new episodes in series four. I'm not going to give any spoilers away, but I think it's better than the third. I think it's the best yet. Here in Russia, they say that there will be only four seasons of Brasic. Is it true? No, that's not true. Uh, we're already uh, thinking about Series 5, shooting Series 5 next year. As far as I'm aware, that's penciled in to start in July. So fingers crossed that does happen. But as far as I'm aware, Series 4 isn't the end. There is a Series 5 on the cards. And the scripts are being written as we speak now. So I think we're all looking forward to that. Let's go back to you. I've read your biography and it's quite a reading. After school, you were in the Navy and you were kicked out because you escaped from the ship to celebrate your birthday, if I'm not mistaken. Tell me about this story. Yeah, I mean, it's not the Navy as you think of it. It's not the Royal Navy. <coughs> Excuse me. I joined the Merchant Navy, which is just freight ships. Um, no uniforms, no saluting, no sir, none of that. Uh, we're just working on the freight ship, and that's what I did as a young lad. Uh, yeah, times were different then. I had my 18th birthday in uh, what is called Mumbai now, which was Bombay at the time. I was a young lad, and, uh, you know, it's fair to say, I went missing for a couple of days, celebrating. Uh, you know, these things happen, especially when you're young. I was in a, a, um, a foreign country. I was young, I was wild, and uh, I was enjoying myself. Also in your biography, I found information about the fight in a bar. You almost died there. Tell me about this accident. What happened? How was, how was it to be on life support? And what is the story about? Well, um, it wasn't a fight. There was a bunch of lads in there. It was just generally hitting people in general. Um, one of them had assaulted my girlfriend. And on the way out to leave, I made a comment to one of them, in which, they, in which case I got a pint pot smashed in my face. He cut my throat with it. And one of them stabbed me in the side, which got my liver, lung and diaphragm. Yes, I was on a life support machine for a while and I suffered terrible with it. I had six major operations. The knife was infected. They had to take pieces of rib out that became infected over time. I suffered for a while with that, but, you know, my first conscious thought when I opened my eyes on that support machine was I'm still alive, so I'm still here. What has changed in you after the accident? And what can you say to people who are watching us right now? Well, my advice uh, is to enjoy your life as much as you can. And I know we all need to earn a living, but there's an awful trap that people happen where they do a job they don't like to buy stuff they don't need. And it becomes a self-perpetuating thing. Um, decorate your life, enjoy your life because it is quite fleeting and even if you're fit and healthy it can end tomorrow at the hands of some lunatic so make sure you, you're doing stuff that you quite enjoy with you it's your life, you know and that's my advice is to grasp the day and enjoy it in your filmography, there are lots of films. Most of them is quite difficult to find in Russia because they haven't been translated. So you can watch them only if you know English. But one film I have watched and it affected me a lot. I'm talking about looking for Eric. This is a story about a loser who's standing on the edge of life and he finds salvation in his mentor. And um, thanks to him, he becomes better. He starts solving his problems. Tell me about this film. Do you have much in common with the character? Yes, absolutely. Um, 
looking for Eric, little Eric in that, as you say, is at a low ebb in life. And um, well, obviously it's all in his mind, but he, he sees Eric Cantona as a mentor, as a source of inspiration, of strength. And throughout the film, we see this loser, if you like, gain confidence, <coughs> excuse me, gain a bit of stature, until he's, he's, he resolves the issues in his life with the help of his uh, imaginary mentor. But I think that's a, a good lesson for people. There's a lot of people out there with certain issues, and it is good to talk, and it is good to air these things. Um, and I'm looking for Eric, if you like. Yeah, the character could be a little bit like me. Um, I've stuck out what I wanted to do, and I've had the, the down times and the lean times. Uh, and I'm all right. I'm doing all right in a minute, but I'm fully well aware it can all end tomorrow. And I'll go back to working whatever job I do to pay the rent um, and keep a roof over my head. I chose this business, so I have to put up with it. Which football team do you support? Well, I'm not a mad football fan, to be honest. I like watching a game. I know, yeah, I know, I see that. Don't worry, Man United. Um, I'm an armchair fan, really. I don't go to a lot of games, but I do like watching a good game of football. Um, I like going to low-level grassroots football. FC United are a good one to watch because it's it's affordable, it's local. And I think they are trying to get back to grassroots because, as we all know, there's too far too much money in the game. Uh, but if I had to nail my colours to the mast, I would have to say Man United um, because my dad was a big United fan. Yes, I was prepared for this. I have number seven. He is Eric Cantona of my era. Yeah, yeah, of course he is, Ronaldo. Absolutely. The man's just, uh, he's unstoppable. And, you know, you've got to admire him. Yeah, he's fantastic, Ronaldo. You can't take that away from him. Can you tell about Eric Cantona on the set? How is it working with a person who has nothing to do with the profession, but who is a brilliant football player, one of the best in the history of Man United? It was fantastic. First of all, I didn't know he was going to be in the film. I think you should uh, say that. Ken Loach. Ken Loach doesn't always tell you what's going to happen in a scene. And I didn't know Eric was going to be in that film. And I rehearsed the scene of me talking to a poster and we'd done take after take after take. And then Ken told me to go outside and so they could get the lights right. I came back in, we'd done it again. And they had Cantona in the room hidden and he appeared. So my shock on my face is real. I didn't know he was going to be in the film. After looking for Eric, you became very famous. You got the Cannes Festival Award, but... Before that film, you weren't that famous. When the film was released, what did it change inside of you? I don't think anything's changed inside of me. The only thing that's changed really is my bank balance. Um, I don't have to do other jobs to support what I do at the minute. Um, so I feel quite lucky in that respect. But I was working for years and years and years as a jobbing actor before I got my break, as they say. And I never got in this business to be rich and famous. I just got in this business to fulfill something that was inside of me, satisfaction with my life. Um, being famous in other countries and having a few quid is a byproduct of that, which I'm happy to go along with. Which is the most favourite and the most important role you have ever played? Being a father and a grandfather. What are your future career goals? Now you have the contract with Brasic and you can't do other films, right? Or do you have some offers? And I mean, in general, how do you see your future career? What would you want it to be? No, I don't think that way anymore. I'm, uh, I'm 62 years of age. I kind of still live for the moment. Um, hopefully, I'll be working on Brassic next year. But if that doesn't 
you come into fruition for some reason or another. I'll just carry on stumbling through life like I have done for the last 62 years and hope that if I keep a clear conscience and, <laughs> and have a good work ethic, that I'll be happy. Well, music. You played in a band The Fool. You were a bass player. After that, you had your own band. You described it as electronic, political, satirical, if I'm not mistaken. What's going on now? Or can you tell in general about this experience and why you decided to start a band in the first place? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, to put the record straight with The Fall, I wasn't really a member of the band. I played bass guitar twice for them. I knew Mark. Mark was a friend of mine. Um, I played bass guitar on a TV program that went out live and I played bass guitar for a gig in Turkey. Uh, that was the extent of my involvement with the fall, but he always remained a friend right up until the end. Um, my band, Dr. Freak's Padded Cell, we were just electronic punk, if you like. When I say political, we were having a go at the British establishment and the American establishment. On our opening track, we had somebody in an orange Guantanamo Bay suit um, and we had and a car battery behind them and we'd pretend to electrocute them on stage to the beat of um, a heavy electronic track with rules shouted through a megaphone. So it was all very a bit surreal and political, but... It seemed the right thing to do at the time. There is a part of your life connected to poetry, and have you ever tried stand-up? Yeah, I mean, again, that was when I was on the dole and unemployed. Um, just to keep my brain functioning and to kind of express myself somehow, I used to do poetry, and my name, my name was Adolf Chippan. It was quite funny. Uh, I wasn't very good at it. I, I used to do the stand-up comedy circuit. There's a lot of comedians out then. I used to do a few gigs uh, doing poetry. Uh, but as I say, I don't think I was very good at it. I'm, I'm probably not very good at acting either. But, you know, you've got to do something that you're happy with. Which do you prefer, to make people laugh or to make people think about something important? Well, the two things are not exclusive. You can make people laugh. And also give them a bit of food for thought. Um, you can't be miserable all the time. So I think making people laugh is the key thing. But that doesn't mean that it, 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 it does, has to be something that they can't contemplate or dwell on. So I think the secret is making people laugh and think at the same time. Behind your back, I can see a pop fiction poster. Which three films would you recommend watching? Yeah, um, first of all, Memento, directed by Christopher Nolan. What's great about that film is it starts at the end and works its way to the beginning. The guy in it that I met, the main character, has short-term memory loss. So for the first 15 minutes, you feel like him until you get used to the style of the film. The beauty's in the edit. It's truly an amazing film because of the edit. Uh, secondly, The Trial by Franz Kafka. The version, my favourite version, is the one Orson Welles did. I think he played the advocate in it and um, the guy out of Psycho, Anthony Perkins, I think his name is. Sorry if I got his name wrong. He was in it. They're two very good films. Uh, both make you think, and both, especially The Trial, it's so relevant today where jo Joseph K in that is going for a trial and he doesn't know what crime he's committed. It's very much like the hate non-crimes that they have now. It, it, it's, it's getting weird. And thirdly, purely as an escapist and a, a film I love, is Flight of the Navigator about a young kid who finds a UFO. I just love that film because it's a lovely bit of escapism. Uh, 
What's about pandemic? Well, you've just said that now we're living through a difficult time and people are changing. And we here in Russia also feel it more than ever because new restrictions appear every day and there is some segregation with all those QR codes and extra restrictions. I reckon people became angry and I think we don't really understand what's going on anymore. Because of that, there is lots of anger. Can you share your opinion on that? And how is it going in England? Well, um, it's pretty much the same as the rest of the world. We're being, I'm not saying the pandemic's not real. I've Apparently I've had COVID. I've had my two jabs. I've had my booster. But the thing is now we've got a new variant again this week called um, Omicron. I just think it's weird that they, they, te- they tend to keep people shit scared so we look up to them for answers. And it's always when there's some massive case going on behind the scenes, like the Giselle Maxwell case, where a lot of um, famous, very, very famous people at the top are involved in all sorts of sordid scandals. So these things, announcements, help distract us from the important cases. Not saying the pandemic's not important. It just seems to be this Omicron's milder. And did have you believe that there's people dropping dead in the streets? There's not. The, the, the recovery rates in the 90s. So um, at the minute, the scare tactics are through the roof. I have one part in my podcast which is called Conversation with Oneself. It's very easy to give advice, but it's very difficult talking to oneself. Imagine that I'm that 15-year-old Steve. What would you say to him? Well, that's an interesting question. The way things have turned out, I'd, I'd just say to my younger self, just follow your instinct, follow your gut feeling, and just remember... It's all about decorating time. And what would you say to an 80-year-old Steve? I'd say, hello, you silly old cunt. <laughs> By the way, I forgot to ask, can you tell me the story about your name or pseudonym? Your surname is your name spelled backwards. How did you get it? Because when I was in the business years ago, in order to perform, on TV or in film, you had to have a, an equity card. You had to belong to a union. So when I joined that union, they wouldn't let me have my real name, which is Murphy, because they already had a member called Stephen Murphy. He couldn't have two members with the same name. So Everts is Steve backwards. That's the only thing I could think of at the time. So my name is actually a palindrome. You read my name backwards, it still says Steve Everts. And that's why I've got a pseudonym, because somebody else simply had my name and they already had an equity card. Also, there is another part in my podcast. It's a questionnaire of Marcel Proust. I would like to ask you some questions from this questionnaire. So the first one, what do you appreciate the most in women? What do I appreciate the most in women? Um, just the fact that they fought, they fought for what they've got. They fought for a vote and they fought for independence. And I like to think that women are achieving that, although there is some backward steps going on. But what I appreciate of, of a woman is independence, strength and confidence. And I'm proud of what women have fought for. What do you appreciate the most in men? I don't, I don't really look at groups that way. I like to um, judge individuals on their own merit. It, it, sometimes to me it's irrelevant what sex or gender someone is. It's all about the person. So what, what impresses me about men as a group? I don't know really. I, I, I don't know. What is your greatest quality? I mean your personality. I don't know. I'd have to let other people answer that. If you couldn't be yourself, who else would you be? (laughs) No one. No one. Yeah, I mean, 
Yeah, no, me, because that's how I am. I, I think like I do, and I am me. I'm not perfect. I've got flaws, but I've, <laughs> I'm just me, and that's I'm happy with that. I don't cover people's lives or personalities or achievements. I just get on with what I can do uh, you know, yeah. to the best of my ability. Maybe not. What personal trait you will never tolerate? <laughs> Intolerance. <laughs> what can you forgive in people? Everything and nothing. How would you like to die? Peacefully. What do you mean? I don't know. I, won't, I don't want to be conscious of the time. I just want to go peacefully. Say something to a person who is watching or listening this right now. What would you like to say? It will stay here forever. Tell something to this particular person. I'd say... Be confident in yourself, believe in yourself, and work for your goals to the best of your ability without trodding people underfoot. There is a happy medium. It doesn't mean that you have to be mediocre. Just aim for whatever you want to aim for, but don't trample on people to do it. Would you recommend visiting my podcast to your colleagues? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I have two more questions. Actually, two questions in the favor. The first question, is Paslovsky really such a jerk? Paslovsky, no. <laughs> he, he's, he's played by um, a friend of mine called Archie, Archie Kelly. And me and him get on so well. And we love Jim and Paslovsky's arguments. We love them. We love filming them, but believe me, me and Archie get on really, really well, and he's a smashing bloke. Yeah, he really is. How do you feel about working with one of the most beautiful women in the world in the same set? Well, I guess all people consider Michelle Keegan to be the most beautiful woman. So how is it? How is it working with her every day on the set? Um, it, it's fantastic. I mean, I agree. She probably is one of the most beautiful women in the world. But uh, Michelle's a, a professional actress and, you know, she's doing the same on set, what we're all doing. We're all, uh, it's an ensemble piece. We're all trying to do the best we can with the scripts we have and the people we're working with to do this fantastic ensemble piece where we come out with this product at the end that makes people laugh, makes people think. It's got heart, it's got soul, and uh, I'm glad that we seem to be doing the right thing as a team. We're a team. Well, in our country, one of the most popular monologue of yours is the one from Brassig, the festival scene, when you don't allow guys to have a festival saying something about post jerks and glasses and the government and so on. and. Also, there is another popular phrase, your pony is a cunt. Can you say something being Jim? I will use it in my promo and my subscribers will shit their pants seeing you being Jim. Your pony's a cunt. <laughs> Thanks a lot for coming and participating in my podcast. I would never think that I can text a person like you and you would agree to talk. Basically, one more time for people who are watching us, this is an example. If you want something, you need at least try. Try doing that and then you'll achieve your goal and get what you want. Well, thank you for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure and I hope you do many more. Thanks a lot. I will send the link for the podcast. We'll be in touch on Instagram. You are the legend. Thanks one more time. I really appreciate and I think subscribers do as well. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.